I came to Zero Trust World because I just find cybersecurity so passionate. I've been really interested on the offensive side of things and using tools that are within my environment to uh, break into a system. I haven't done it yet, but I find it super fascinating. Working at Osceola County Schools, uh, being involved in security for education, it's very important to be aware of everything that is going on in cybersecurity. But it just gives us the idea and the ability to be able to have the right tools and how to respond to incidents and just be well aware of everything that is going on. You know, hackers get smarter every day, so our job is to get smart along with them. I think it's a good opportunity to network for sure, to, to see what tools and products are out there, and it's a good opportunity to learn a little as well and just have a good experience. Being able to hear from experts that understand where things are going, that have the time and resources to dedicate to that, is really beneficial to me at, at the MSP level to understand what's coming next so I can better prepare, better scale my defenses, and try to keep my clients safe for what's coming tomorrow. Well, good morning, everyone, and good morning, Anne. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so we, we asked Anne to join us today. Uh, Anne is an MSP based in the uh, Boston area in Massachusetts, and um, her, her company, Ucaro, uh, specializes in helping small businesses improve their cybersecurity. And they really are a very important partner of ThreatLocker, and we've worked a long time with them. And what we found is they, they really do care about small businesses and protecting them from cybersecurity. What we'd like to do today is have an open conversation really about cybersecurity, what the state of cybersecurity is, and, and what businesses can do to protect themselves. So... You know, I think probably a good opening is what's in the news right now, which is obviously a lot of attacks in Vegas, MGM, Caesars, and, and various casinos going down. So uh, in this case, it was it was a large company, but what's your thoughts on small businesses, Anne? Yeah, I think that when, when there's a big event like MGM, um, one of the impacts is people see that in the news and it raises awareness. And that's a great thing. But one of the sort of unintended consequences is that people may see that, okay, great, I'm not a big company like MGM, so I don't have to worry about all this. And so it can kind of go both ways. And I think it's really important for folks to realize that cyber threats can impact anyone, small businesses, big businesses, most attacks are indiscriminate. And uh, we just don't read about the small 10 person CPA firm that might get hit by a cyber attack. We read about MGM, but it's really hitting everybody in everybody. Well, and I think before, before starting throughout locker, I, I spent about two years. Well, I, I started spending two years doing ethical hacking, showing companies how we can get into businesses, but I ended up spending most of those two years actually working on ransomware recoveries. And 90% of the clients I was working with were actually small businesses. And I remember one client quite distinctly in Australia who was an insurance broker that I'd been brought in to help do an instant response. They'd paid a $22,000 ransom. And back in the 2014, 2015, ransoms were a lot less. And they hadn't got their data back. And it, it really hit me when the owner of the business was, was essentially brought to tears because he realized that everything he'd built his entire life was wiped out because someone downloaded something they shouldn't have. Um, I mean, I'm sure you probably see this a lot, especially with customers, you're onboarding new customers who are coming to you. How often do you hear small businesses being attacked? Um, well, in our line of work, you know, we see this happening around us and we can't talk about, it. you know, it's the specifics of what we see, but it's kind of an eye opener. Now more and more people may know somebody who knows somebody who's experienced an attack. But, you know, I've been on the, the phone with people um, very bright people who say, I, I, I got tricked, I, got, I clicked on this thing, and, it's like, I'm, and they'll always tell me, I'm so embarrassed, but this, this is what happened. Or you know, folks who have gone through, called us after um, they've had a security incident and need to step up their security, then they kind of got the reality around it, need to step up security. And it's, I think what people don't realize is how an, an emotional thing it is. I think most people walk around saying, oh, oh well, that's not going to happen to me. And that's what people will say, like, I never thought this would happen. But it is, um, you, you know, you mentioned somebody being brought to tears. And we've seen that, too. And uh, a lot of very big companies have the resources, have the capacity to rebound and get back in action. So I'm fully confident that MGM will be um, the great brand it's always been and will continue to operate. The small business might not be able to recover. And it is, it's a lifetime worth of work that could just evaporate with a bad click of the mouse. Well, and, and I think that's it. And what companies don't realize is the, the question that people often say to me is why would someone, we've got nothing that anyone wants. 
So the MGM has lots of money and the banks have money. So everyone's going after them, but we don't have things that people want. Our data isn't that important. We're a construction company and it's not important to the attacker, but it is important to you. And what these guys have realized is Mm -hmm. that if the reputation damage of your data being dumped on the dark web, even as a small business, because they'll do that. They don't just encrypt your files. They, they'll t- post them on the dark web. And then they'll even go as far as emailing all your customers, telling them that they hate you, they stole your data <laughs> and just yeah. to embarrass you. And the damage to you is more than the damage to them. So this is what they want. They want you to be damaged so you can pay to not be damaged. And yeah. if you've got cyber insurance, quite often that'll put cover a chunk of it. Although try and get cyber insurance again afterwards, it gets very, very difficult. Um, But also they know how much cyber insurance you have. And in reality, the cyber insurance is probably going to cover about 40 to 50% of your losses. Uh, The ransom itself, maybe, but all of the other system downtime, the user downtime, the employee losses don't, doesn't get covered by your cyber insurance. Yeah. And and the, the um, enormous stress on employees, the uncertainty they have to deal with. And and people may think, you mentioned one really important topic that cyber insurance is getting harder and harder to get. So now the questionnaires are really long um, and they're going to ask, and, and you mentioned they will ask, have you had an incident in the past that could make somebody uninsurable? Even if you you know, got the message and you're doing everything right now, it's that's a blemish on you. And you can never transfer 100% of risk. You can transfer some of your risk to insurance but not 100%. Um, you know, the other thing you mentioned was you know, the double extortion. It used to be you get a ransom request, you pay the ransom, hope you get your data back. But now the double extortion, hey, we're going to expose your data, the triple extortion, we're going to go out to your customers. That, will, that could cause tremendous damage to a company. So the, the game just keeps racing. And I recently read an article, I, I kind of thought of them in my mind as sort of the Walmart of ransomware, because this is a, a group that specializes in small ransom amounts. So when you read about the big companies, they have very big dollar amounts associated with the ransom. And there's other groups that just, you know, will go after, you know, several thousand dollars here, several thousand dollars there, and it, and it adds up. It's, it's big business. And that's why folks are doing it. And with cryptocurrency, they can commit all these crimes anonymously. So it's it's a pretty big mess. Well, and I think that's the difficult part. It's the money's untrackable, everything's untrackable, and they they do get paid. And I think I think one of the stats I read from the FBI was ninety four percent of the time when you pay the ransom, you get your data back, which seems like pretty good odds. But if you had to wake up in the morning and say there's a six percent chance my business is going to fail, and someone's going to make a million bucks out of me in the meantime, that's a pretty blood boiling. Uh, experience for you so it's yeah. 94 isn't that much the case that i dealt with in australia they didn't get their data back the other problem yeah. is even when you get the data back and even if they don't publish your data on the internet um the way that cyber criminals work is they try and get pieces of information to decide who to attack next so i, I kind of like thinking if you get a cyber attack and you fully recover and you pay your ransom and in two weeks time you're back up and running you're feeling good about yourself it's kind of like breaking a mirror. You get seven years bad luck after that because what you're going to start yeah. seeing is yeah. other companies that you do business with, your customers are going to start to get cyber attacks. Because think about this. Mm-hmm. How do you trick a user into doing something? You find out something about them that they would ordinarily do and you intercept that communication. So if, if I always get an invoice from you, Anna, you always get an invoice from me and you suddenly for $5,000 a month and then suddenly you get one saying, hey, your invoice says $5,000, we've updated our bank details, you're more likely to fall for that trick than get in a random email oh. from someone else. Yeah, absolutely. Depending on, you don't know who else you're doing business with, so maybe your data is safe, but you're getting an inbound email from somebody else who's been compromised. And I was recently talking to a small business owner who's very um, into classic cars. And what he didn't know is somebody had intercepted the email chain. He was negotiating to buy another car. And while he wasn't compromised, this other, the seller was compromised, interjected themselves into the email thread and was almost got away with getting the wire transfer out of that. So, and everything seemed very natural because there's a whole email thread that goes along with it. And some of these tricks are just, they're very clever. Also, I've read, you know, in many statistics that if, if you yourself are, are hit, it's, it's very likely that um, you could get hit again with a ransom attack because you don't know, like, was everything cleaned up? Who knows? It, it, basically, they know that, that you'll pay. And then, you know, you mentioned up the 96, uh, 94% of people getting, actually getting the data back. Now, remember, you're, you're paying criminals who are 
horrible people. And so you're, you're dealing with criminals. So that's kind of a scary thing to begin with. But there is some honor among thieves because the whole scheme doesn't work. If, if, like, if nobody got their data back, nobody would pay. They kind of have to give some data back, but you never know what's going to happen next. And do they, do they have data? Are they going to get interceptor customers? It, it's, it's, it's a scary thought. And folks who have been through it, there's like a whole creep factor to this thing that um, maybe you sort of read about the statistics and the numbers, you can kind of get numb to it. But when you've talked to people who've actually been through an event, it's very, it's very emotional. And um, it, it's kind of a scary thing. And people, I've had people say, like, I did not know this was possible. Now, it's, it's more in the news now. But, it, you know, they feel like this is like something out of a movie or even like with MGM. I recently, so I was flipping through the channels and I saw one of the Ocean's Eleven. You kind of think this stuff can't happen and it does. Well, and it's kind of like Venom was about the car stolen. Um, my car was stolen last year, and I, I well, this year maybe I'm, I'm losing track of dates so quickly. Yeah. And after we got it back, my wife was like, "That I don't want to get in that car." And uh, you know, I got yeah. in. And this doesn't feel nice. And uh, now I, I got over it pretty quickly because I'm I'm too busy to worry about it. But I, when I bought, got it yeah. back, I was like, "I want to get a new car." And, and I only yeah. had the car less than a year, but it, it felt dirty. And, and the same applies with your system. The other problem is. So I'll give you an example of a ransom case um, that we actually stopped, but when we put it in our lab, we saw happen. There was a, a vulnerability in exchange two years ago or last year, and mm-hmm. one of our customers had a vulnerable exchange server <laughs> that onboarded, it was actually an MSP who onboarded a new customer, and the customer was vulnerable. And about a week after they onboarded them, they hadn't gone through and patched everything yet because they were trying to get all the security tools in place. The, there was a block in ThreatLocker. So we'd blocked a, a file from running, on the exchange server, it seemed pretty benign when you looked at it, it was a batch file. They basically took that batch file and we put it in one of our labs because they were like, this is a major ransomware attack. And we ran it and what happened was, is it, they'd injected a, a URL into the offline address book, which caused something to be downloaded to the exchange server when a user downloaded their offline address book through the vulnerability. Someone had logged in, someone, the, an admin had logged into the exchange server to perform maintenance. That caused the batch file to try and run, which had been blocked. But when we ran it in our test environment, it downloaded a series of scripts and shells and executables and created a group policy to push out ransomware to every device in the company. So within two hours of me running that in our lab, our, our unprotected lab, it actually encrypted every device. Now, if we had paid the ransom on that, of course, these are all test machines, the all of the devices could have been unencrypted. On a perfect day, we put the key in, everything works perfectly, everything's unencrypted. The problem is, do you trust that there's not a backdoor on those machines? So the reality is, Oh yeah! Imagine you come yeah. in and you've got a hundred machines. You've got to rebuild every machine, every server, everything from the ground up. So all of your IT systems, you have to assume that there's a backdoor in them. So you have to rebuild them. And some of that isn't stuff that the insurance company will cover. And you have to. And if you don't do it, you can get recompromised. And you, and you yeah. don't know if someone's in there listening to your data. So you have to build everything from the ground up. And like I said, these guys are criminals. They're not exactly honest. Yeah, and and it is. Uh, it's like a house break in, or you mentioned. Uh, the car theft, it, that, that creep factor again. There, there was a lot in, in your comments around like what technically happens when software is deployed like that. And I think that one of the really important things for folks to know is exchange, uh, Microsoft email, that's something everybody, you know, we all use every single day. And this stuff can be hidden in there as well. So there's so much money in cybercrime that there's so many clever things that the folks come up with to do. You know, October Cybersecurity Awareness Month is a great time for folks to be aware that the link that looks perfectly normal could be bad. And, and I'm a big fan of anybody could fall for this stuff. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of don't blame the victim. We want to train our folks. We want to uh, make sure that folks are aware of the different threats. But some of this, I mean, it could happen to anybody as well. What about resilience? Of, uh, cyber resilience is a new word we hear quite a lot. Um, what's your thoughts on that? The cost of it? How do you become yeah. cyber resilience? Is it, is it more cheaper or more expensive than a breach? Is, is the risk worth it? taking one of the really important things for you know any business you know large businesses small business to think about is if something were to happen then what's what's your response plan going to be what would it take for you to get back in action so you mentioned maybe insurance is a component of that to cover some of the financial loss to get you back in action but you know with those hundred systems you're not it's, it's not going to cover everything if all your systems are down and you can't access any of your data. Do you have e- even a, a list of employee contacts? You know, we, we store everything on computers right now. If everything were shut down, what are you going to do? So thinking through that process and coming up with a 
you know, even a basic game plan of, well, what would we do if this happened? And then having some things lined up ahead of time could kind of make or break the chances of recovery. And the recovery is way more expensive. So the things you can do, the protect, the tech respond, you know, all those things that you can line up ahead of time are going to reduce your chances of an event. And then, you know, if all else fails, you're going to have to recover from backup. Those backups better be rock solid. So going through this and not just kind of thinking, well, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll wing it. If that day comes, I'll deal with it. It's, it's, it's going to be extremely painful and you do run the risk of not being able to recover after that or being an enormously expensive that's the thing it's it's either too expensive or not being able to recover and then the loss of customers and the loss of uh credibility and, and in yeah. some cases maybe your customers don't care because you you sell tractors to farmers or uh, and they say so this company got hit but think about not being able to do that and i think we saw that with colonial pipeline is when you think about oil pipelines they're quite often you, you got the 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 old-fashioned way of thinking almost the good old boys club of you yeah. know the pumps and mechanics and monkey wrenches and all of these other things that people, these companies were built before technology even existed. And then suddenly over the last 50 years or 30 years, they've become 100% reliant on technology. So their business mentality yeah. has never been about protecting technology. It's always been about protecting my pipes and my, my pumps and, and stuff. Like that. And then suddenly they get hit and they can't operate. And, you know, we saw nearly a, not just a, a business crisis, but a, a national crisis Oh. Two years ago with the Colonial Pipeline being hit. About two years ago, yeah. Long gas lines, um, really you know, impact in the physical world. Make it hardening those environments and, and making yourself more resilient means protecting them. Uh, just like protecting your house, protecting your car. You don't leave your key in the car. So I, I'm yeah. on a security note, and even I managed to forget my key in the car one day. Uh, you don't leave, you know, you have alarms okay. on your house. You're making yourself more resilient, but then you have a plan to recover. So well, what happens if that we get hacked what happens if someone gets in how far can they get what checks and balances do we have in place to limit the damage and then what do we have to do to recover and then what do we have to do to transfer uh, and transfer should be the last point of call if, you, if you're calling your insurance company one day if you find you're calling your insurance company you failed as a security professional you failed as a business to protect your assets and now you're trying to claim on that and you never want to be in that situation. Every year we get hurricanes through Florida. I trim the trees. We, we board up the windows. But at the end of the day, when the tree does come down, you go, okay, well, I, it was our neighbor's tree, so I, I didn't trim it. <laughs> it there was, yeah. That's when you rely on the insurance. But you don't want to do that in a cyber case because yeah. the damage is more than a tree falling on your house or your car being stolen. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had um, talked to small business owners, and, and and the knowledge has really increased over the last couple of years. So if I go back a couple of years, I remember talking to a small medical office, says, oh, we're not worried about security. We have insurance. And it's like, no, that's not how it works. You can't. Uh, and, and, now, and, then, and the insurance companies now have a long list of questionnaires. They want to actually see evidence that um, you're, you're doing all these things in here. But, you know, the, the, the things, that, the preparation ahead of time, like you said, about, you know, cutting down the trees, you minimize your chances of the impact. And and kind of thinking it through because on that panic day when you get the whatever the ransom request comes up on the screen you're not gonna be able to think straight and you may not be able to access any of your systems and on colonial pipeline um, and when you go back what i find really interesting and from what i've read about and i don't know all the details but from what i understand there was a, a vpn account for an employee that no longer was with the company that wasn't didn't have multi-factor authentication on it so it was like this little tiny crack in the armor that was exploited. And then they had to go ahead and kind of shut down the whole network. From what I've read, the, their network actually was properly segmented. But just as a precaution, they had to shut down. So the, the event became even worse than it would have been from the beginning. And then we saw the long gas lines. You're, you're from England, but uh, you know, when I was a young kid, we had the energy crisis in the U.S. where I remember my dad waiting in the gas line. Saturday morning, you'd go get gas. You could only get gas every other day. That's what the lines looked like. You thought, like, that would never happen again. And then it happens because of some cyber event. So it's, you know, it's just, and, and not trying to scare people, like all these horrible things can happen, but there's really a lot of the smart and affordable things you can do ahead of time to try to minimize your risk. You know, cut down those branches, don't leave the keys in the car. And that's the equivalent with cybersecurity, I think. When we think about security, I, I kind of have this philosophy, there's three ways, because my, my goal is to stop cyber attacks, because yeah. yeah. responding to them is never fun. But there's yeah. three ways we can stop a cyber attack. 
And neither of them are foolproof. The first one is the human way. It's about like a, we're a cybersecurity company. So we take security really seriously. All of our staff go through regular training. We try and do phishing tests on people to see if they click on it. And But uh, the idea of this is we, we make sure people know that there's a risk that people can hide links. And my thought on that is that you're going to reduce your risk of an attack quite substantially, but you're not going to remove it from nothing. And I would actually go as far as saying probably 25% to 30% of people in the right circumstance will fall for a cyber attack. Probably yeah. more than that if it's the perfect circumstance, the perfect storm. But if you're just a general, if you send out an email to 100 people and say, hey, can you download this? You put it from a, a yeah. who your IT department, can you run this on your computer? Can mm-hmm. you put your password on the site? Can you update your credentials? 25% of people will actually fall for that. Now we can reduce that. I think you can reduce it to 10% by giving people training, but 10% is still not perfect. So this is why we have mm-hmm. layers of security. And I, I don't know if you engage in much training with your, your end users, and. Oh, yeah, we do, we do a lot of training. We do it internally, too. And, and one of the things is um, when you run simulated phishing tests, because everybody thinks, I would not fall for that. No way, I wouldn't fall for that. Now, with AI and different ways to scrape information and compromise other parties, these attacks get way more sophisticated. And, and the way I approach it, you almost can't think of every possible way that somebody could be attacked. But if you, if you know things that they could do, um, for example, you could spoof, well, this, with the phone, you could spoof caller ID. People could fake who the email is from. As you mentioned earlier, they could kind of, if they infiltrate a, a system or just scrape LinkedIn to find out, you know, who's the boss, who's the finance person in the company, they can do a lot of damage. But when you run the actual simulated phishing tests and people click on that and then, you know, it comes out in the report, that I think is a real big eye opener for, for folks. So we do um, weekly micro training with folks. Everybody on our team has to do it. We'll occasionally like give out an Amazon gift card or something. Who's at the top of the leaderboard? But try to make that aware. And you know, as you mentioned, that you you can greatly reduce the risk. And I'm thinking of one small business in the area. They had gotten a, a fake email from Better Business Bureau that there was a um, a negative comment about their company that was out there. And there was a person in the office. <laughs> who spent like two hours trying to open the email because every piece of security was preventing it from open, opening. And I don't even know what they did, but finally they opened it. And it was a, it was a big site. Uh, it, was, it, it wound up being a piece of malware on there. But they didn't know like, that like all these brands get impersonated all the time. So if they just have that little piece of knowledge in like, hey, I've heard that brands could be impersonated. So this was an employee trying to do the right thing. Like, oh my gosh, I want to find out what this negative comment is. I want to um, make sure we make this right because I don't want our other customers to see. They were trying to do a good thing. And they tried so hard. to Everything was blocking, but they kept trying to open the email. And if they just kind of pause for just a little moment. It's like, wait a second. I've heard that emails could be impersonated or, you know, when there's a sense of urgency in there that maybe that's something I ought to look for. I think that greatly reduces the chance of, of, you know, opening that, that wrong link. So I actually got an email from an MSP probably two years ago, maybe even three years ago, and it was forwarded on mm-hmm. from a customer and it was a similar, similar scenario. She, she, she'd received a resume and the attachment name was Maria resume. And in the body of the email, it said, enter password 1234 to open the resume, which to me as a cybersecurity professional immediately says, I'm not opening this because who puts a password on their resume when the email is yeah. someone, this 1234? It's kind of, I'm either security conscious or I'm not security conscious. And yeah. I, I'm not going to put a password on this 1234. I'm either just going to send it. So I would have just not even opened it. And I received a lot of resumes. And it was um, a doc file. They opened it and they got a message saying in the body of the email saying, or in the detachment saying, you've got to click enable editing and then you've got to click enable content. And the user did this and big warnings come up saying that this can allow the attacker to run something on your machine. And something popped up in the bottom right corner of the machine saying that a batch file was blocked and it was threat locker popping up saying you've blocked a batch file. But even at that point, the end user who had been trained um, unfortunately, sent got so mad that she couldn't open this resume. She really needed to open this resume. She's trying to fill this job position. Mm-hmm. She sent an email to her, her MSP or IT provider saying, you can't block me opening these things. You're not supposed to block me opening these things. That was a piece of ransomware. And yeah. even despite all the warnings, the user was so intent on getting that document open. They're going yeah. to make mistakes. But that's why training them is important. And then hoping 
you know, not expecting that it's going to work, but it will reduce your probability. And if we can keep reducing probabilities, life gets a lot better. Yeah, and, and especially watch out for forwarded emails because I could get a, a, um, an email with I, an email with a um, an attachment with a threat. I might just be really busy. Hey, and I send it off to somebody on my team. Hey, can you review this for me, please? And now my employee would be getting an email from me. Which is now I, more credible. I didn't, I didn't vet the email, but now they th- oh, I better get right on this. So uh, that's another really, it's another risk factor in there. And I'm, I'm thinking of a, um, one, one of our clients uh, years ago, and it's an, it's an engineering firm, and controller got an email from the, the head of the company, and it had some sort of threat. And it said, um, you know, pardon my typos, this is from my iPhone, like people have on their iPhone messages. And, and the way she called, I was like, wait a second, he doesn't have an iPhone, he has a, an Android. <laughs> like, but this like little, sometimes people will catch on the littlest thing, but there is a human element of um, all the protections in place can't 100% uh, protect us. And there's that human element in there as well. The other area of protection and the, to stop a threat is the, the idea of detection. And this is yep. where we take all of the data um, um, uh, that we know that is bad behavior and we apply that to behaviors of compu- users on computers, of malware, of yeah phishing sites and we try and block it. So we say, this site is a known site. We've seen, you know, as a, as a software, as a security company, we've seen this as a bad site. It's been reported 10 times. We're going yeah. to stop. So if we, a user gets a link to this site, we're going to shut it down. We're going to block the IP address. We're going to, or, or if the mm-hmm. wording in the email is that, that looks like a phishing email, they use various algorithms to try and detect it. Or if it's a piece of malware that happens to do X, Y, and Z, um, then it's going to be blocked. That, is is a very important part of security but it's in many cases in small businesses it it seems as the end of security it seems as the this is what we need we need an antivirus to detect bad guys we need an anti-phishing device to, or email filter to detect phishing and we need a web filtering that's going to detect bad websites and then they say okay i'm good now because i've got these and i think this is where a lot of small businesses have fallen down and even large businesses as they've invested quite heavily in these these tools that do detect and do reduce the risk of malware or phishing and failed on in that. And they think that these tools are magic and they're going to stop everything. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking just yesterday, I got a, an email from one of our VIP clients said, Hey, how did this email get through? So they, they, they knew it was a bad email because we have protections in place. And I'm hoping my t- team has already responded. These, whatever protection levels you have in place. So like pr- protecting for incoming email, there's you know, spoof protection and, and looking for malware in the emails, you know, opening it. There's a lot of things you can do to help protect the inbox, um, but they're not 100%. You know, it's that, that whole cat and mouse game concept where as people have more defenses in place, the threats get more sophisticated. So you need, you need to think about cybersecurity in a different way. And it's just, it's, it's just ongoing. So uh, threat actors can design things specifically to get through those defenses. I want to talk about the third way of detecting, because and, and look, all of these should be parts of your cybersecurity strategy. And the third one is this yeah. idea of controls. Now, the mm-hmm. idea of controls is that there is a limitation on what is needed in your environment. There's physical, tangible, I say physical, virtual, you know, stop points yeah. you can put in place. And it could be something as simple as my front desk person or my marketing person doesn't need access to payroll, therefore, she or he does not have access to payroll. Um, And and that is a physical control. And even if you 100% trust that person, even if it's your CEO, if they don't need access to payroll, I don't need access to payroll in ThreatLock. I have, you know, we've got 300 staff here. I no idea what 90% of them get paid. I don't need, I don't run payroll. I don't change payroll. So I don't access it and I can't access it. If I try to, I I don't have permissions. And that is a control, Mm -hmm. but controls also go beyond that. It's, It's also the idea of, a dual factor authentication. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you have a user who opens a phishing email and then they put their pat and the detection tool doesn't stop that phishing email, you want a physical tangible control like a push to their phone, like a, a second code that yeah. prevents the attacker getting into that system. It's a physical control and that's really important as well. And that's where I think, I feel a lot of small businesses have fallen down. They haven't implemented things like whitelisting they haven't implemented things like ring fencing and even p- least privileged permissions and dual factor. And, and that's where almost that's the final piece 
or in my case, I, I would say it's the first piece of security and the rest is the, fight, the backup. Yeah, I think, um, and also kind of think about like, for folks, you know, whether in a small business or a big business, don't don't blame the IT department for this because some of this stuff is, you know, it, it is annoying to end users. You know, every once in a while, I get challenged for multi-factor authentication for my mail on my phone. You know, it's another step you have to go through, but it helps keep the organization secure. In terms of the whole concept of allow listing, people will say, "Well, I need to install this software, so I need admin privileges." And even dealing with people, you know, inside the IT team, like, no, you don't need to be super admin on everything to do your job. So I, I think, you know, education around that and explaining, you know, letting everybody do everything is kind of a recipe for disaster. And as you mentioned, and that's, you know, I think the amazing thing that Threat Locker does is that, you know, when if, if something can get through whatever defenses you have, if it, it's going to try to run and it's doing something bad, that's, it's going to get stopped. I hope that people don't blame their IT departments every time they have to enter a multi-factor authentication or they don't have access to something they think, you know, I should have access to that because the concept of least privilege, the idea of using, you know, second level of authentication, you know, challenging, you know, hey, just because you're in the network doesn't mean you're allowed to do everything. And and then the concept of, you know, these are the applications we use for our business. And you can't just install whatever you want on a free work Chinese computer. Coupon, your free Chinese coupon clipper that can read all of your passwords. Uh, and, oh, and yeah, that, yeah. We see that one a lot. Businesses didn't realize when they come to ThreatLocker and they get a report from ThreatLocker, they didn't realize that they have 130 different Chrome extensions that can all see their passwords, including oh. Chrome extensions made in China and they, yeah. <laughs> and Russia and all of these, and they can all see their passwords. And they say, well, why do we have these installed? Like, well, your user has added them. And the user doesn't realize because they get a pop-up and it says, hey, you can save 20 cents on this. Save yeah, uh, sure. they say, we download this clip or even $10. And what they don't realize is that they are the product now, not the, not the, not what they're buying as a product. They're the product. The user becomes the product because the coupon clipper is collecting all of the data about them in, in an ethical way sometimes, or maybe unethical, but in a legal way sometimes just to sell them and market them more information. But in yeah. a less legal way, quite often extracting data, exfilling data, and just collecting data to use in future cyber attacks. Or um, even, you know, um very reputable applications like uh, may, like Dropbox, somebody could be using that. Maybe they're just going to work from home at night and they're going to transfer files. Like you do really need to know exactly what's running on the network. doesn't matter the size of the company. And, and then also putting safeguards in place so that users aren't just downloading anything. I mean, maybe they're getting that coupon clipper to save the company money, right? Sounds like a good thing. But um, yeah, you don't know what that software is doing. Uh, well, actually, one of our um, one of our staff in the UK, we, we have, um, and this sounds really stupid, we have these signs on our dishwashers that say whether they're dirty or running. And in, I'm oh, sorry, Ireland, our Irish office said, oh, we want those signs. So instead of going onto Amazon and ordering the sign, uh, she, she, she said, oh, it's a quarter of the price on this website. And she it caught, and it caused so much chaos because all the credit company credit cards were then cancelled because we say five dollars or ten dollars, and yeah, so, yeah. sometimes the, the and that's that's not an IT security, but that kind of problem, it, you know, users are thinking they're helping the company, but they're not necessarily yeah. helping the company because what we got is a, a transaction from a Chinese uh, company, and we no one knew what it was. It was a name that wasn't yeah. recognized, and we ended up shutting down yeah. all the corporate cards, which caused massive chaos. For, for, for two oh, weeks. Yeah, that's that's a that's a giant it's a, a giant domino effect, and there's a really big impact on time. And all of a sudden, you know, folks are working on straightening that out. Just and it started with such a little simple thing where employee was trying to do the right thing. Just consequences. Yeah. Well, one last topic I wanted to cover was physical security, um, and then I'm going to ask you about how MSPs can communicate these points with their clients. How important is physical security when it comes to cyber in your mind? Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the really basic things is locking screens. So um, just, you know, when you walk away from your computer, there should be a timeout on it or you hit the Windows key plus the L and just lock your screen. You see that a lot at, um, you know, people at airports and places. The other thing, and I looked this up years ago, so laptops, from what I read, retain about 50% of their value as, as stolen products. So people might sell them on eBay or whatever, like, hey, I've got this laptop. And, and that's actually a very high percentage compared to other stolen property. So laptops are very I don't know, attractive things to steal. 
And so, you know, f doing full disk encryption on a laptop to make sure that uh, nobody could actually get to the data if they got the laptop, that's, that's a really important thing. And then, you know, the other thing is the old do not put passwords on Post-its around. So the mass data security law, that went, and went into effect, and it's kind of funny to think about it now, in March of 2010. And it says that you must have a reasonable way for managing passwords and they must be strong passwords lying around. So you think about a medical office, somebody steps away from a front desk and then you wind up with a HIPAA violation because data might be exposed or a schedule of appointments, et cetera. And it, it's, actually, it's actually important because the, the whole physical screens, and I used to do a lot of ethical hacking and rubber yeah. duckies was one of the tools I'd use, OMG cables to get into a oh. company. And you can yeah. gain access, and, and, I, and I see it, and, and maybe my mind just thinks like this. Every time I go into a hospital, every time I go into a doctor, and they walk out the room, and their computer's not locked, and I see USB ports, and I think, yeah. this, this, this is like, I, I look, and I'm not a bad person. Uh, well, yeah, no, not really, no, but, so, but other people might be. Yeah, and somebody might be um, doing it for fun. I read about a case years ago, um, the Houston Water Department wound up getting hacked, and it was just some, it was some person who was just a, he wasn't trying to do anything bad. He just wanted to, oh, I just wanted to see if I could get in. Like, I was kind of curious. I just wanted to try. And it turns out they had some critical, I don't know, piece of control um, electronics on their system that they never changed the default password for. Didn't say what the password was, but it was a common three-character password. So, like, that's, that's what it is. And, and um, we're talking about a water department for a major city. So, you don't know who might just do something out of curiosity and wind up causing a lot of damage, too. And then you don't know, you know, who the bad actors are out there. Yeah, the, the rubber ducky with the keyboard that, yeah. that gets, you know, installed without your knowledge. That's, uh, there, there's just a lot of possibilities out there. So, I, I'm also always uh, kind of on the lookout. Just making sure your devices are physically secured, your, your ports aren't yeah. on shelf. I see it in car dealerships and I see it in hospitals and I see it in all sorts of public facing companies where people can go in and they can yeah. sit at a desk and they can walk up and they can plug something in and the network ports even so much so. And look, we can do oh. virtual things to protect from physical. So you may have a network port in your reception, your business, those kind of physical controls, think about them and think about, well, if they're there, how am I mitigating yeah. the fire? risk? Whether it's I'm using network controls, whether I'm using something else, yeah. software, if I have a physical port, how do I protect from that? Yeah, because you don't want somebody to just be able to walk in with any laptop and plug right into the wall. And I was doing a little um, cybersecurity info session for a senior center recently. I was telling folks to actually plug, if, if they're going to charge their phone or their laptop, actually plug it into the wall. Don't use, don't stick it into anything where you're just sticking in the USB portion of it because you don't know what, get the actual block and plug it into an electrical outlet and, and use your own because people have the fake cords and all that stuff out there. So it's just phenomenal all the different points of entry that are potentially around us. So I've got a couple of questions here. I'm just going to read them out as a, as a, yeah. uh, first one is a, an easy one to answer. What is a rubber ducky? Um, so a, a rubber ducky, I normally have one on my desk to demonstrate, but I'll quickly show, oh, I do have one. So a rubber ducky yeah. is essentially a USB device. This is one here. It looks exactly like a USB device and they come in two formats. One is they can look like this and there's another one called an OMG cable which this may or may not be because I can't tell, which looks exactly like an iPhone cable. So yeah. an iPhone charger. And unlike a USB storage device, it doesn't present as a storage device when you plug it into your computer. It presents as a keyboard. Um, this one, um, when you plug it in, it will actually type out text. And you can get it. To, it it's a good tool. It can be used for good purposes. It can be used for automation. Um, it can yeah. be used for automatic keystrokes, but it can also be used to do things like open PowerShell, type a command to exfil mm -hmm. your data. So this one here yeah. has a command to actually exfil data uh, via PowerShell. So it will control R, send out PowerShell. Um, uh, now the OMG cable, which looks exactly like an iPhone charger and an Android charger, works the exact same way. The only difference is when you plug it in, the keystrokes don't happen on plugging it in. It has a wireless antenna built in so you can connect to the attacker, connect later on and send those key strokes, strokes through a phone. Um, it is actually responsible for a lot of large cybersecurity attacks. And two years ago, I wanna say, someone offered yeah. a Tesla employee $500,000 to plug one into a computer on Tesla's. Yeah. So very cool devices, but also very dangerous devices. Um, so, and can be used. And interesting well, fact, if you block USB drives, they will not block a rubber ducky because it's a keyboard, yeah. not a USB it, drive. Yeah, it's a lot for the general public to know, but you know, just a general policy around, hey, if you see a USB stick in the parking lot, don't plug it into your laptop to say, oh, I wonder what's on this. Like, 
it, it could be something else. And the, and the thing about charging is use your own charger and use the little power block to plug into the wall, not that, you know, those free chargers. Because you can imagine them when, you know, somebody was incentivized to, to use the cable, but what if somebody, you know, they did like a giveaway, like, hey, get this free, uh, get this free cable. Cheap devices or getting free, free devices, I would <laughs> highly recommend you don't use. Yeah. <laughs> don't take it. If it's free, it's not worth it. Yeah. So I have another one, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say it out there. I I don't know the answer to the question, but I, I hope we do. Um, and yes. the wording's a little bit strange. Thoughts on SMBs, uh, lib web, um, p vulnerability. Are SMBs high risk, and how do we mitigate lib web p vulnerability with threat locker? Um, and it's worth noting the vulnerability is essentially a feature in code that is not in, you can do what it's not intended to do. I don't know the answer with threat locker, but. Um, the, so I'm, and I'm going to go look that up after this and I will actually get a, web, yeah. a blog post posted on it. So uh, typically most vulnerabilities need to do one or two things. They need to, they, they'll take a, a process or an application and that process or application can now will access data that it shouldn't be able to do and be able to reach out to the internet and exfil that data. Or maybe it changes that data and encrypts files. Mm-hmm. Um, the, it, Threat Lock has this component called wi- ring fencing, which allows you to say, what does this application need to access? So if something like Microsoft Office, it needs to access your documents, your files, but something like your Logitech QuickCamp support app or um, move it, don't need to access your files. So typically the mitigation isn't removing the vulnerability because you can't move the vulnerability without patching. But what it does is it me- removes its ability to damage or exfil data that it shouldn't be able to do. And um, the other thing it needs to can do and is, is most common actually is it executes software in, in your behalf. In that case, whitelisting, allow listing will actually block that software from running. I don't know if you've got any comments on that. Yeah, well, I think you brought up the concept of ring fencing and that programs. I think that that's a real eye opener for folks that any program you run basically has access to anything on your system. So by restricting it to only do what it's supposed to be doing, you're, you're going to greatly increase your safety. And, and I will get a blog post actually posted on the yeah. lib, LibWeb directly after this. Yeah. Someone's asked, is there a way to block a rubber ducky from a physical point? So obviously not having your ports accessible is a really good way of blocking it. And disabling unused ports, physically not blocking USB storage, but physically blocking unused ports is always good uh, security. Uh, we were checking into the Omni last year uh, for Zero Trust World, and I genuinely, and no one believes me, accidentally dropped my credit card down the back <laughs> of her monitor. And um, I, I, I could see it. And, and no one believes this was a mistake but because <laughs> and I'm looking down there and I, and I can see it. I, I believe trying, you. <laughs> I'm trying to re- reach my credit card. And she said I can reach down and get it behind it. And I couldn't reach it. Uh, but, but I managed to touch four USB ports on the way down. Yeah. And she, yeah. she didn't question you're, you're behind my computer. You can't do that. And um, the customer took a picture of me, my legs in the air, leaning over the counter trying to reach my credit card. <laughs> uh, and she actually then invited me around the desk to pull the computer out and get the, the credit card. Uh, of course, I didn't do anything. I did say to her, and it was our, at our cybersecurity conference, our hacking yeah. conference, because we have our hacking labs. And I said to the lady, I said, oh, it's just as well as not a hacking conference in town. And she said to me, what's that? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. But physical yeah. access is important in those cases. Um, uh, sorry, Anna, I'll let you see if you've got any thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I think... Um... Yeah, don't don't let other people handle your computer. And that's, you know, for areas that are exposed in the company. So medical offices, this is important for where the, the public is coming in there, hotel, like maybe just like a little block there and then training the employees. If somebody drops something, the em- employee needs to retrieve it. So that's some security awareness training. That's another topic for it. Yeah. The, the other the other question is, is will threat locker block the rubber, rubber ducky by default or is there some manual configuration that needs to be done? So technically, no, Threat Locker will not block a rubber ducky um, because you can't, unless you disable all keyboards, you can't block rubber duckies and you, you want to be able to use your keyboard. However, rubber duckies need to use an application to do something. It's just a keyboard. So in most cases, in this case here, we use PowerShell to exfil your data from your computer. And when we plug this in, it types a PowerShell command out and exfil your data. You can use um, curl, run DLL, C script. You've got to use an application to actually get the data out. Now you can cause some damage without an application. What ThreatLocker will block is block applications from doing more than they need to. So PowerShell doesn't yeah. need to do your data. 
neither does curl, nor, neither does run DLL. So simply taking that access away means it can't export your data. It also doesn't need to go out to the internet in most cases, except explicit examples. So when, again, we're not stopping, because if you'd like, a rubber ducky is a vulnerability. The ability to plug in an automatic keyboard or any keyboard is a vulnerability. Yeah. But we are stopping what they can do with that vulnerability. You don't necessarily need a rubber ducky, by the way. I've done the same thing before by hijacking the wireless signal on a cheap wireless keyboard. So Bluetooth keyboards, they have encryption, they're validated. But if you go yeah. down to, I'm not sure what the computer stores are now, Best Buy, I guess, and you buy the yeah. cheapest keyboard they've got on the self shelf with a dongle, they probably have like three frequencies that you can switch between. And if you go and buy, you get another keyboard matching the same frequency, you actually can sit outside and just type the keystrokes in yourself. Uh, yeah. Um, but we won't block the rubber ducky, but we will um, make it much harder to do anything with it. Um, yeah, keep it from doing stuff. <laughs> now, I, I think one final thing I'm going to ask you, how can you as an MSP and how can other MSPs help communicate this risk with their client and what they need to do? Because I don't like the fact I have to use dual factor every time I offer, log into Office 365. I'm not cursing my IT team out. I'm cursing Microsoft out because it's so yeah. hard, temperamental. But how yeah. can you communicate the importance of this and why customers need these tools then? Yeah, I mean, I think um, trying to explain it in terms that people can understand and just saying, hey, here's the possibility of things out there. So when your computer is asking you for updates, just keep it updates because that, that will protect against the known vulnerabilities that are patched, keeps you safer. We do, we do a lot of training. So we have the weekly micro training. We have annual tests that we do with folks. We do the simulated phishing tests. We do a lot of webinars for our clients. And one thing that I think now, like that hopefully the pandemic is long gone and doing in-person events. Cause I find that I mentioned I was out at a senior center recently talking to a whole bunch of folks. Once the conversation gets going, then people are like, Oh, I know somebody, this happened to them and everybody's sharing information. They're asking about home. We did another really great session at a, a law firm with about 20 people and getting, once you get the Q and a going and it's not like, Oh gosh, you know, they're going to tell me I got to patch my systems. I got to enter, you know, MFA 600 times a day. Once you get kind of past that, and getting people to think about how they relate to technology, people really light up. And then, then, um, then I think they're really learning at that point. I like that physical events because people who know people who have been hacked or had a breach or people who have had a breach themselves understand this. But people mm -hmm. who don't just say, well, I've been fine for the last five years. W yeah. What now? So putting people together in a room is a really good way of getting stories told. And yeah with similar types of businesses. And they can, they can then say, oh, this actually happened to you. I want to solve this. We're kind of running out of time. And just as always, we're giving away free tickets to Zero Trust. We're giving away, I think, a free ticket to Zero Trust World and a free hosted pass to Zero Trust World. Just to recap, Zero Trust World is our annual conference here in Orlando, Florida. It is in February, so it is the nicest time to visit Orlando, Florida. Yes. <laughs> Sky's blue, it's a nice 70 something degrees. And it really is a great few days. Typically a, a pass, I think we've got a special on as well, which we'll be putting in the chat so, soon. A pass is $500 for a ticket. And we have a discount of $200, which um, someone very kindly will post into the chat for me for marketing. But we are giving away two free tickets. The first one is just a free ticket. And the second one is a hosted, which means we're going to pay for your flights, your hotels, and every, your food, everything you fully hosted on Threat Locker to come to Zero Trust World. Oh, yeah. I just want to mention one thing that um, also the first uh, 20 people to sign up get a copy of my book. Free, that's signed. So I want to hold that up. Cybersecurity for Main Street. Do you mind just explaining what the, 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 the basis behind the book is and what it's going to help people with? Yeah. So I, I wrote the book, um, basically how to explain all these concepts in, in plain English to empower people to embrace cybersecurity and not be intimidated by it or be angry at the IT department. So it goes through, it's, a, it's, it's written like an exercise book. So it's 21 days, strong passwords, using multi-factor authentication. And um, one of the things, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, how do you talk to folks about cybersecurity is um, never, as IT professionals, we should never be thinking about, oh, well, I'm going to have to like dumb this down for somebody. We should talk about cybersecurity in a way that really empowers people to feel confident about taking the actions they can take to learn and better protect their own environment, their company's environment. So that's the mission behind the book. Your book is available on Amazon yes, as well? it is. So you yeah. said there's there's free uh, 20 copies for the first 20 people that signed up. Is that to the webinar or is that to Zero Trust World? Or? I, I think it's who signs up for the expense has organized this. It's the first 20 people who sign up for Zero Trust World get an autographed copy. 
<laughs> yeah, so the first 20 people who do sign up for Zero Trust World um, will get an autograph copy of the book. And you're going to be at Zero Trust World, Anne? Yeah, I'm going to be there. Looking forward to it. Yes. And uh, and you can also, if you if you don't manage to sign up in time, you can also get a copy of the book on Amazon, I'm guessing. Yes. <laughs> so uh, you please look for it on Amazon. If you can just give us the name of that book again for everyone. Yeah, it's Cybersecurity for Main Street, CyberFit in 21 Days. It's an well, accessible approach to cybersecurity. And I really appreciate you you joining us today. And, and thank you for being a Threat Locker partner. And I look forward to seeing you in February. Final thought, if you do not, um, if you don't get, if you didn't win a ticket for Zero Trust World today, you can actually get a free ticket by passing your Threat Locker Cyber Hero test at Zero Trust World. So your ticket will be refunded when you get there. If you pass it, it really is a few cool few days in Orlando, Florida. We teach you how to use rubber duckies, how to use Metasploit, how to actually break in systems, write successful malware, but also how to defend, how to harden Office 365, how to harden Windows servers, endpoints, and other things like that. It's a great hands-on three days. Of course, like any good IT event, we have some great speakers coming in. We have some great engineers and we have a really great after party as well so uh, if you do need cpe credits you can get those so if you haven't signed up for zero trust world the link is in the chat and i appreciate everyone joining us today thank you Anne, and thank you everyone else all right thank you this was fun